almost every time cooking your own food is going to be a healthier option than eating some kind of fast food or at a restaurant or prepackaged food. Who pays for all of the cost of the heart disease and diabetes and dementia and liver disease and kidney disease and obesity related diseases that are downstream from that. Who pays for that? You know, well, not McDonald's. The American taxpayer. The American taxpayer, uh, 100%. You know, it might be more expensive to grow organic broccoli, but we could pay the farmer or we can pay the pharmacist. And I would rather pay the farmer every day of the week. Jeff Krasno, entrepreneur, wellness pioneer, and the driving force behind the transformative Wanderlust Festival. His journey from music industry innovator to wellness advocate showcases his commitment to fostering meaningful connections and promoting a holistic approach to life. You're not gonna totally eliminate all of the toxins in your life. It's impossible. We tend to be very, very sick as a culture. Big pharmaceutical companies that then offer drugs and then we get stuck on this cocktail of pharmaceutical drugs for the rest of our lives. So we became kind of post-World War II obsessed with the creation of very, very cheap, shelf-stable, abundant calories to feed a growing population. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Over the last year, 86.6% of our regular viewers have not yet hit the subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It's a small gesture on your end and a huge leap forward for our channel. If you wouldn't mind, we would love to ask you if you found our channel informative and engaging, if you can please hit that subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It allows us to go ahead and continue to put out great content, better guests, and as always, we will always put out two episodes per week. Thank you so much. You mentioned that toxins are everywhere, in our water, the air we breathe, the makeup we use, food, even the smell in a brand new car is toxic. So what should we do with this information? How do we adapt uh, to all this? First of all, thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate connecting with you guys and, and connecting with the community that you're building. Yeah, I mean, this is a concept that I broadly think about it as the, your exposome. Okay, so that's a, a, a word that is coming into sort of greater zeitgeist or fluency, I suppose. Um, it, it's all of the sum total of all of the exposures in your life. So yeah, that can be the off gassing from your mattress or you know toxic cleaning products that might be used on the inside of an Uber or you know just depending about how many particulates are in the air at any time just in the air that, that you breathe um, certainly they can be in the food um, that you eat and then there's also toxic behavior the people that you choose to be around or if you spend too much time on social media now you only have a certain amount of agency over your exposome but your exposome is unbelievably important it is the number one determinant of your overall health it's essentially everything that washes over your genes that triggers their expression in one way or another. So you're not going to totally eliminate all of the toxins in your life. It's impossible given the way modern culture uh, has been engineered. And, and you shouldn't preoccupy obsessively with doing that because that's its own form of pathology right? right but what you <laughs> but what you do need to do and this is kind of my general message is to take as much agency as you possibly can empower yourself with knowledge knowledge such that you are reducing the amount of toxins 
where you can. And so, you know, of course, you can start with food, for example. That's a one place where, where you can start. You can certainly start, you know, with relationships. Who are the people that you want to be around? How are you actually getting your information? Are you um, just like getting your news in the most sensationalist and hyperbolistic way on TikTok or even on like a, you know, CNN ex excerpt or a Fox excerpt? Or are you actually, you know, reading long form articles or listening to very in-depth, brilliant podcasts like yours? You know, and, and so I think the more aware we are of the toxins are, of our environment, the more agency that, you know, we can take, you know, over our own health. And, you know, certainly I could go through the list and, and, and bullet point out like glyphosate and ast and atrazine and all the different ones. But I mean, again, the, the beautiful moment right now in terms of culture is that most of that information is available if you choose to actively go and learn about it. What do you it. think? Is it always has it been always like that in terms of toxicity in the food in the in the air in the chemicals and all the stuff or is it like just last decade or two yeah i mean certainly it hasn't always been that way at all i would say you know about 150 years ago uh you know with the kind of emergence of the industrial revolution you know that's when we started to see the the um, efflorescence of, of toxicity in our life. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly going back to the way that we evolved over hundreds of thousands of years as Homo sapiens and then, you know, millions of years as hominids, there was very, very little toxicity. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, you know, over th these unimaginable long swaths of time, we evolved in relation to our environment. And so in the absence of toxicity, our body engineered itself with all of these incredibly miraculous adaptive mechanisms for life. Um, and in the last 150 years, in many ways, toxic culture has upended our engineering or our biology, and in many ways has turned our own adaptive mechanisms against ourselves. So. The, the most glaring example is with food. So we became in a post-World War II obsessed with the creation of very, very cheap, shelf-stable, abundant calories to feed a growing population. And, and that wasn't necessarily a nefarious intention, right? But what was the knock-on impact of cheap, shelf-stable calories? Well, they became laden with refined sugars and refined grains. They became ultra processed. They were devoid of fiber and certainly of other kinds of core nutrients that the body requires to function and to make energy at the, at the subcellular level. And what do we end up with? Well, we end up with a population that is now, at least in the United States, 45% obese, and we seem to be very, very good at exporting <laughs> that particular diet around the world. And, you know, you're seeing the degradation uh, of human health because of essentially a toxic food system that has all sorts of misaligned incentives. And then, of course, the, the general way that we address these pathologies is through big pharmaceutical companies that then offer drugs to essentially address the symptoms of these, what I would call preventable and reversible diseases. And then we get stuck on this cocktail of pharmaceutical drugs for the rest of our lives. And so you see how, you know, the systems and structures that we've created in our society is just full of profit-driven misaligned incentives and who loses out well the the individual and, and our own health and of course it's not just us it just radiates out to our families and anyone that might give us care right now at least in the united states we spend upwards of 20 percent of our entire gdp on sick care on essentially mm -hmm. treating the symptoms of chronic disease the one that was created initially by a itself 
A hundred percent. And we keep doing that. We keep creating our own problems and then trying to solve them and then creating more problems as we go along. And, you know, this is kind of the big conundrum. It's like, okay, we can all sort of find some sort of level of intersubjective agreement here. We tend to be very, very sick as a culture. So then what is the solution? Is the solution to keep, uh, you know, chasing technological moonshots to try to change our genetics to meet our culture? Or should we just look at our culture and make very, very simple changes in our lives in order to actually realign the way we live, our lifestyle, with the miracle of evolution, with our biology, with our core engineering? And it seems to me that the latter is so much in, uh, of a of a fail safe and, and easier choice, but candidly, there's a not a lot of profit to be made, right. um, you know, through fasting and exercise. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. You've really touched upon uh, culture and food, so I want to bring this topic up, whether or not it's a debate, but let's talk about European food. It's, it's a lot of Americans always compare. Uh, you, if you take a look at the ingredient list from American uh, uh, cereals, let's say, or I, I have a screenshot that we'll post on the video here. I have a Quaker oatmeal uh, version here, uh, uh, image in front of me, and the ingredient list is four times as long as the UK version. And in fact, the ingredients, when I look at the UK version, it's, it's very simple to understand. Rolled oats, sugar, freeze-dried raspberry pieces, strawberry pieces, natural flavoring. Whereas the US version, if I were to read it right now, I mean, citric acid, red 40, artificial strawberry flavor, and so on and so on and so forth. So first of all, my first question is, is the food safer in 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 Europe, what's going on here, or is it not really? Yeah, I mean, I, I will uh, freely admit that, that, that this isn't necessarily my my target of, of expertise. That being said, um, you know, certainly I've I've seen, for example, even McDonald's um, ingredients, you know, from let's say a McDonald's on the Champs Elysees in in Paris versus a McDonald's uh, in the United States. Or even you know the the example that you just gave, um, you know certainly ingredients in Europe seems to be simpler. You know that they're actually using real food instead of artificially generated food stuff. And when you use artificially generated food stuff, you know it might taste good. It might be engineered to hit a certain bliss point in your brain, essentially, um, and, and release a lot of dopamine. So you feel that sense of motivation and reward to eat more of it. <laughs> um, certainly, that's what's happening in the United States with big food and how our food is engineered here. But if you eat simpler ingredients, particularly whole foods, you are going to get not just, you know, the the energy substrate from that food, but you're going to get these whole host of phytonutrients and chemicals that are absolutely necessary at your core biological level in order to operate your human vehicle. And we're just simply not getting those. Like in the United States, for example, you know, we spray most of our crops with a, a chemical and herbicide whose active ingredient is known as glyphosate. Glyphosate, for example, kills all of the organic matter in the soil, kills all of the microorganisms, right? So microorganisms are responsible for generating a lot of the core nutrients that mm. should be available in our food. It's actually microorganisms that fix nitrogen from the air into mm. the soil, okay? So when you block that pathway, well, nitrogen, 
essential for the development of amino acids, which we all need. Those are like the building blocks of life, right? So um, when you can, when the, when the soil is unable to use nitrogen, and then if, of course, then we compensate by putting like an ammonium nitrate, like a, a synthetic fertilizer into the ground. But what's happening is we're simply not getting the amino acid, um, profiles or, 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 or essential amino acids, the nine amino acids that, that our body do not make endogenously that we have to get from diet. They're being blocked by various different kinds of herbicides that we use rampantly uh, in the United States. And, you know, Europe is way ahead of us on that front. And I believe France has completely eliminated like glyphosate, for example. Mm. So there's that. There's also in Europe, when they tend to um, harvest their wheat, for example, they will bundle it um, in the field and there will be a fermentation process that will happen in the field where, um, where there is sort of a pre-digestion of some of the gluten. And so, you know, where in the United States, uh, you know, what we're doing is something completely different. We're essentially, for, say, for, for reasons of efficiency, we're spraying glyphosate at the end of the harvest season to essentially desiccate to make the crops dry and ready for harvest. And then we harvest them all and immediately freeze dry it. So we don't get that natural bacterial processes uh, of fermentation and pre-digestion. So you look at like when we eat then like our white bread or whatever we have in the United States, massive gluten intolerance right well you don't really ever see that in europe right. and i'm sure you've got you know friends that come back from europe and say oh my god you know i ate the baguettes in in paris or the or you know yes, the peasant yeah. bread and all that stuff and i felt fine but when i eat it here in the united states oh man i get constipated or it gives me a stomach ache or i tend to gain weight quickly well you know that's kind of just anecdotal but you know, behind an anecdote, sometimes there is there is some sort of core core mechanism or core truth there, and and it, we just simply do things uh, differently here. And you know, this is you know, uh, you know, chest beating capitalism at work, right? We we don't really you know value individual health. We 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 tend to you know put profits over over people. Is it even possible to get the good food in the U.S. or? I'm sorry, Vlad. Can I modify your question? I want to. Is it possible spending the same money that any average American family would? So I, I want to keep mm -hmm. uh, re realistic here. So let's just say that I'm an av average American working family. I spend whatever it's two hundred dollars per week in groceries. What can I do as the average family consumer to be? more conscious of my choices that will ultimately benefit me? Well, candidly, this is an area that's it's very difficult because, you know, that we see such wealth inequality in the United States and you can map health inequality right on top of, of economic and income inequality. They essentially are the same thing. Right. And so you know, yeah, it's like, you know, if you're in that top 10%, you can afford to go buy all your groceries at Whole Foods or in Los Angeles. There's like, even if you want to go to the next level, there's like Erewhon, you know, it's just off the mm, charts yeah. expensive. Right. And, but you're availing yourself of, you know, organically grown nutrient dense food. Now, I actually did a research project uh, last November, or December, um, in in Los Angeles. I went down and I spent the day at a Seven Eleven, because candidly, a growing percentage of Americans live in what we call food deserts or food swamps, where the only available food is is from a convenience store. Right, and it's it's crazy that they call it a convenience store because it candidly leads to a lot of inconvenient realities but so but i spent the day in um a 7-eleven now granted it was in los angeles so the prices at this particular 7-eleven given the rents in los angeles were significantly higher than probably one in like tulsa oklahoma or in in you know indiana somewhere 
but and I assume maybe they they vary in terms of what they have in there. But the 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 goal, the target of this project was to say was to actually find out if Seven Eleven was the only place I could shop. What is what are the healthiest and most economic choices I could make? And I put a list together of eleven <laughs> um, of food foods at 7-Eleven that you could buy to optimize health um, mm. and, and and do it on a budget. And so, you know, but obviously 7-Eleven, I'm, I'm certainly not trying to say that that's a good option, but I tried to essentially create a possible option mm. for people. Um, I think where, you know, it really begins is in your own kitchen, you know, almost every time cooking your own food is going to be a healthier option than eating some kind of fast food or at a restaurant or prepackaged food. And so I would say buy raw ingredients and cook mm -hmm. in your own house. That's the first place to start, you know, if you're on a budget with food. Second one is eat whole foods, not processed foods. And that means eat the whole apple. Don't eat some sort of, you know, industrial rendition of what the apple used to be, which is like, you know, dehydrated and skinned and you lose right. all of the fiber, you get, you know, massive sugar concentration, etc. Don't drink the apple. For example, <laughs> apple juice is about one of the worst kinds of foods that you can actually take in because the sugar and the fructose content are off the charts. So I think it starts with just becoming more mindful about, you know, what you're putting in your body. And yeah, you know, where you need to sacrifice organic, that's okay in, in, in some circumstances. Um, but um, it, it is possible. But again, this is a place where there's, you know, uh, you know, tremendous polarization. And, and it goes back very much to, you know, the structures and systems that we've set up around big food. You know, we had this farm bill that is, you know, you know, the, the, the primary um, piece of legislation that governs agriculture um, in the United States. And it, it was set up again with, with um, high minded principles and intentions to protect farmers from times of, of drought or floods, et cetera. But what it ended up doing was fixing prices and providing subsidies for farmers to grow cash crops, essentially like soy, wheat, sugar, sorghum, basically like five or six cash crops mm -hmm. and be able then to sell those and corn, of course, and sell those under their true cost of production to, uh, food product companies. And so, you know, if you wonder why McDonald's is able to offer like this happy meal for like a dollar 99 or something that seems just like an absurdly low price, it's because we have essentially given McDonald's a subsidy to be able to buy mm -hmm. their core ingredients under what they truly cost to make and grow. Wow. And so then they are able to turn around and then sell that at a profit to people that are socioeconomically strapped. But then who pays for all of the cost of the heart disease and diabetes and dementia and liver disease and kidney disease and obesity related diseases that are downstream from that? Who pays for that? You know, well, not McDonald's. Right. The American taxpayer. The American taxpayer. A hundred percent who pays for them. And then of course those people turn around and they have diabetes. So what do they need? They need insulin for the rest of their life. Type right. two diabetes. I should, I should specify onset, adult onset diabetes. They need insulin for the rest of their life. They need metformin for the rest of their life. And now they need Ozempic $950 a month for the rest of their life. You know, this is, this is crazy absurd. And, you know, Yes, there are ways to take agency, you know, over our own health as it pertains to food, but we really also need our institutions and and private enterprise to to wake up to the fact that yeah, 
you know, it might be more expensive to grow organic broccoli, but we could pay the farmer or we can pay the pharmacist. And I would rather pay the farmer every day of the week. And from your mm -hmm. experiment, what was the best food from the 7-Eleven? <laughs> it's funny. So um, I think what you're really looking for uh, in, in one's diet anyways is um, you want to get a significant bolus of, of protein a couple of times a day. And ideally, you want lean protein. Um, so you want protein that doesn't come with a ton of fat attached to it. Um, because fat is going to be very, very caloric generally. And then some people do not do well with high concentrations of saturated fat in their diet. So what I found was the canned chicken and the canned tuna. Now, yes, there's heavy metals in the canned tuna. Probably there's some other things that you might want to avoid, but those were very, very good options. In fact, and very, very cheap. Like, yeah. I can't remember the prices right now, but I think for like $2.50, you could buy some canned chicken that had like 25 grams of protein in it. Mm. It was yeah. not bad, you know, right. like, um, um, so those were kind of the protein heavy options. Um, there was like some Chobani non-fat plain yogurt. Um, I think that product is fairly widely available, maybe not in every 7-Eleven, but again, you know, you're going to get um, a lot of protein there and you're going to, you know, cap your over your overall caloric intake, um, you know, if you get the non-fat one. I'm not against fat necessarily. I just think you want to be mindful of your overall caloric intake and, and there's, you know, nine calories for every gram of fat. So. So those were the high protein options. There was some decent like bars that I found, you know, like a RX bar and maybe okay. a Quest bar, had some fiber, decent fiber in it and pretty decent ingredient list. Like, I, I can't remember which one, I think it was the RX bar. It's like, I got like, um, like I could actually, yeah, yeah, I could actually read and, and decipher what ingredients were in there. I think the, you know, the, you know, of course, ninety eight percent of the stuff in there was just all crap. And they, the crazy thing is, like, they have a candy aisle. So they, that I mean, who knew that there was like literally forty different kinds of Skittles that you could buy? But apparently there is. And so I was going down the candy aisle, and there's just sugar, 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 sugar on one side, and then pharmaceutical products, boo, 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 right on the other side of the same aisle. Wow. So they sell you this, and then you come back and you need that. The other place you got to really watch out for in convenience stores or really anywhere at this point is the drinks, the drink products. That's where you're going to get this just unbelievable amount of sugar, you know, mm. 45, you know, 50 grams of sugar in some of these drinks, you know, and it's not just Coke and Pepsi. Of course, you know, those are certainly some of the more nefarious players, but I mean, I was even like in some of the juices that market themselves as healthy, the amount of added sugar in there. I mean, like mm. 20, 25 grams of added sugar in some of these drinks. I mean, like 12 ounces. <laughs> it's like yeah, un crazy. crazy. Yeah. And then you look around, you're like, oh, why, why is there these, why are these cresting rates of diabetes among kids? Kids. Yeah. You know, because that's where they go. That's where they buy their food. Well, you know what, Jeff? Yeah. I, I actually grew up eating canned tuna, uh, maybe some canned <laughs> chicken and stuff like that. I, I, I grew up in a, a, a very low-income household, so it's exactly with what you said. Um, and in our community, and I know it's a problem in America in general, but in our community specifically, South Asian people, uh, the rate of diabetes is incredibly high. It is a very scary statistic. Now, I know that in a couple of years ago, I, I, I know that your fasting glucose levels were actually 125. 
sure. which for, for, for those of you who don't know, that's, that's in the pre-diabetic, borderline diabetic range. So I, I know you got that down fairly, very quickly. So I, I do want to kind of spend some time over here talking about how you got that down, uh, because I know there's a, a couple of very important components that I think that people or at the very least from my community, can benefit from because we have a lot. If you're an adult in my community, it's probably a 85% plus chance that you have diabetes. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I, I have heard that statistic. I didn't know it was that high, but that is, um, that is really concerning. I mean, here, the, the good news, the gospel here, though, is that if you can catch your diabetes at a certain place, you can manage it and you really even can reverse it. Now, of course, mm -hmm. what you want to do is prevent it in the first place. Right. Right. Um, so, you know, I, as you mentioned, you know, my um, fasting blood glucose was 125 milligrams per deciliter. My uh, hemoglobin A1C was 6.7%. So as you mentioned very astutely, that is right on the highest end of prediabetes and, and, and diabetes. So I, you know, wear this continuous glucose monitor okay. on my triceps. Mm -hmm. And for those who um, are watching this on video, uh, you'll see it's a little disc that I, that I put on my triceps, which uh, syncs with an app, which allows me to, um, it's essentially a glucose dashboard into the vehicle of my, of my organism here. And I always say like, you wouldn't drive a car without a dashboard, right? Um, and you know, if the oil light, oil pressure light went on, if you were me, you'd probably blow it off for a couple of days, but eventually <laughs> you'd probably deal with it. So when I started to, you know, got, um, you know, that dashboard into my metabolic health, it was, um, it was a wake up call. So what can you do about it? You can do a number of things and I'll just share with you the three most potent things that I did to essentially tame, you know, the wild tiger of my glucose. And I'll just say that my fasting glucose now hovers between like 75 and 85. And it didn't really take me that long to go from Bring essentially borderline diabetic to this optimal range. Hmm. So the first thing is, of course, diet. So, you know, for me, I adopted sort of a plant focused or plant forward ketogenic diet. So that meant a lot more plants, so a tremendous amount of fiber. Um, so go get your fiber. You can get that in nuts and leafy greens and other places. But what fiber does when you, you eat it, you don't actually, um, well, soluble fiber or insoluble fiber. Insoluble fiber is the one that grandma takes, you know, with the Metamucil <laughs> or whatever, keep, keeps her regular. Right. Um, that's helpful too, but soluble fiber, um, you know, you don't digest it. It, um, it basically converts into sort of a gel like lattice, if you will, in your small intestine. And it slows down the absorption of macronutrients from your small intestine into, um, into your bloodstream. So basically you're main maintaining these kind of very, uh, like rolling hills, uh, of glucose kind of crests and troughs instead of these massive spikes and then deep valleys, which is what you want to avoid because then you get hyperglycemic and then hypoglycemic and you're driving your pancreas crazy because your, your pancreas is producing so much insulin um, in order to vacate that glucose from the bloodstream. And, and this is just a, a general concept that's helpful for people to understand, even if you're not into medical science or physiology, is that any molecule in excess will create a resistance to itself. Mm. So a lot of, a lot of insulin, hyperinsulinemia, they call it a lot of insulin in your bloodstream. Eventually your cells are going to become resistant to that. And many people are familiar with that with like alcohol, <laughs> like you, you know, it's like, if you drink three beers every night, it's going to take you more beers to get drunk, right? Or if you, right. even with coffee to some degree. So over time, I became insulin resistant because I was stressing my pancreas so much to produce so much insulin, right? So fiber 
And eating fiber really, really helps with that because you're slowing down the amount of glucose entering the bloodstream. So eat fiber, um, obviously reduce or you know, virtually eliminate refined sugar and ultra processed foods. And, and, you know, carbs, I'm not going to demonize carbs or carbohydrates completely. Um, but you really want to lower your intake of carbohydrates just because it's so easy to get them in our, mm. in, in the grocery store. I mean, if you basically Every, all of the uh, middle aisles of the grocery store are pretty much all carbs. Right. So they're, they're pretty easy to get. So lower your carbs, up your fiber, up your leafy green consumption, et cetera. Um, that in combination for me with a 16-8 fasting protocol. Okay, so I'm sure some folks in your audience are familiar with intermittent fasting. The 16-8 protocol is the one that I adopted. So... I condensed my eating window, so I consume all my food within an eight-hour window, okay? So on a nutrition or diet side, those were the things that I was doing um, that where I saw an immediate um, response to my glucose levels. Hmm. So fiber, lower your carb intake, lower your ultra-processed food um, intake, et cetera, and, and, then, and then the fasting protocol. So aside from nutrition and diet, I started to um, uh, adopt a, a cold plunge um, protocol. So some people might on Instagram and TikTok see a lot of people like getting into, um, you know, tubs of, of very cold water or, you know, ice. Um, that is also an incredibly effective protocol for upgrading your metabolism, okay? Because really what this all comes back down to is how well, how efficiently does your body produce energy, okay? At the mitochondrial level, those are those little organelles in your cells that are the power plants, right? They, they produce all this currency called ATP, which is what we burn for energy, right? So what you wanna do is make sure that at that cellular level or subcellular level, your power plants are working like a well-oiled machine, you know? And when you're delivering them too much substrate, too much glucose or too much fat, there's gonna be a supply chain problem, right? So you, you wanna just think about it in, in some, some ways in, in terms of that. With cold water therapy, what you're doing is you're submerging yourself in 50 degree water, could be 40, you know, honestly, it's very subjective. You can mm -hmm. get a lot of benefits from, from whatever actually honestly subjectively feels cold. And when you do that, your core body temperature is going to plummet. So generally that hovers right around 98.6. There's about a two degree variance across the course of the day, but generally that Goldilocks zone is right around 98.6, right? So when you get into a cold ice bath, your core temperature is going to plummet and your body is engineered to foster balance in human organism. That's called homeostasis. So immediately this little uh, thermometer in your brain that's regulated by your hypothalamus is going to say, we need to warm your, we need to warm Jeff up. <laughs> we need to warm Vlad up immediately. <laughs> and and what happens there? Your cells, particularly your mitochondria, has to make energy to generate heat, right? So it looks around for that energy substrate. It uses that substrate. It makes energy. Your body makes heat and it thermoregulates and it gets you back up to 98.6. So it, it starts to grease the wheels, if you will, mm. of your metabolism. But here, where here's the real, mm, like the real trick, if if I can share it with you, which is I started to stack my low glycemic diet and my fasting protocol with cold water therapy. So I just described what happens in your physiology when you get into the ice bath. But what if you get into the ice bath before? you've had your first bite of food of the day. So let's say your first bite of food happens at 11 a.m. So what if you get in the ice bath at 10.30? Mm. 
-hmm. So your body goes through that process. Your mitochondria starts looking around for energy mm -hmm. substrate and there's no glucose around because you haven't eaten in six, 15 and a half hours. So you're very low blood glucose levels. So what is the only other energy substrate available? Fat, that's the other substrate that your body burns. And basically when you need to thermoregulate, your mitochondria is gonna go and essentially trigger this process that breaks down fat or triglycerides in your fat cells and converts them into free fatty acids and in some cases ketones. So the mm. ketogenic diet, again, people are familiar with that. And you are gonna burn fat, you're gonna oxidize fat for the use of energy to essentially upregulate your, um, your heat. And this was unbelievably impactful. Um, for my blood sugar and just my overall metabolic functionality. My basically my I basically upcharged my mitochondria. So those two protocols together. And then the last one was resistance training, honestly, mm -hmm. getting into the gym and actually lifting heavy things. And so through this process of hypertrophy of essentially growing muscle, your muscle is essentially becomes a metabolic organ. And even at rest, your basal metabolic rate, the amount of energy that you're burning, even at rest, if you have more muscle will go up. But the other thing about muscle is that it is just a glucose vacuum. Mm. When you have a lot of muscle, basically it is a sink. It is a vacuum for glucose. And the thing is a contracted muscle doesn't even need insulin to uptake glucose. Mm. So those three protocols together, a nutrition diet protocol, a, a cold water therapy protocol, and a resistance training protocol. Listen, everybody's different. We're all bio individuals, but <laughs> For better or worse, you share 99.9% .9 of my DNA. <laughs> and I apologize for that um, <laughs> in some cases. But, but there are, even though everyone's individual, there are some general principles that apply to human physiology. And I will say, if you, do, if you stack those three protocols safely um, in consultation with your doctor, you are going to see results that are significant and maybe miraculous. What, what about the det mm. detoxification wow. process? Did you do some protocol? Yeah, so for, for detox, yeah, I think one thing you actually have to be careful about when you lose a lot of weight or if you go on a protocol it is actually um, the release of toxins because toxins are generally lipophilic. They, they store themselves in fat cells. Mm. And so when you're burning a lot of fat, you can sometimes not feel great mm. because, um, you know, because the, the, the toxic load that is generally stored in fat cells um, becomes circulated. I mean, obviously when you're doing that, eventually your kidney and your kidneys and, um, and your liver begin to process it. I mean, there is some detoxification process that can happen like in a sauna. So that's the another kind of therapy, like a heat therapy. Um, obviously, you know, humans have this unbelievable uh, ability to perspire. You know, we're not the only mammal that can do that, but we're, but we're very good at it. Um, and, um, and obviously through sweat, there is some detoxification process that happens. Um, also through contrast bathing. So, you know, your lymphatic system that, that helps to process a lot of the toxins in your body um, through essentially getting very hot and then very cold and going back and forth because heat is a vasodilator. It opens up blood vessels and cold is a vasoconstrictor. It closes down blood vessels. So when you go back from the heat to the cold, you're going to kind of create this like vascular pump, if you will, mm -hmm. that's going to essentially be able to circulate. Um, it's great for your circulatory system, but also for your lymphatic system. And you're going to be able to detoxify um, with greater efficiency. What about the de detox uh, with the supplements or with the juicing or not eating gluten and all mm -hmm. this stuff? Yeah, 
I mean, gluten, I would, gen, you know, I generally avoid gluten because it, it's generally associated paired with carbohydrates. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, juicing, I think can be very impactful. It's not something that, that I did. Juicing can also be um, like a, a wolf in sheep's clothing too, because when you juice, particularly fruits, you know, what you're doing is removing a lot of the fiber that's naturally in fruits and you're just getting the juice. Um, so that can sometimes have actually high sugar content. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly there's, there's like fantastic juicing, um, protocols and, and regimen. Um, it's just not, it was not something that I focused on. What, a, what about the sleep? Does it contribute to yeah. detox as well <laughs> or no? Yeah. Huge. Yeah. I mean, you know, most of the restoration and repair that's happening in your body is happening when you sleep. And so uh, sleep is completely foundational to good health. In fact, as it pertains to diabetes um, or insulin resistance, even one night of bad sleep can mm -hmm. essentially raise your insulin resistance. And that is actually adaptive um, because, again, like I said earlier, we basically are engineered in relation to our environment. So in the summer months, you know, when it's lighter later into the evening, you're generally going to get less sleep and that's okay. And then you become, because you're getting less sleep, you become a little more insulin resistant. So your body is not using energy substrates for energy. It stores it as fat. And this is nature's brilliance because back in the old days, <laughs> That was adaptive because winter was coming mm -hmm. and there was going to be a yeah. scarcity of calories. So at the end of the summer or early into the fall, you were getting less sleep. Insulin resistance was going up. You were harvesting, you know, fruits and vegetables. You were eating, you know, your loincloth was getting a little tighter around your midsection or whatever. Not great for Instagram, but very awesome for your health because you were moving into a period of, of fallow for winter, you know, but of course now, you know, culture has made it, made winter absolute, obsolete, right. right? We can always get food. And so when we can always get food, uh, you know, we we're continually storing fat all the time. So sleep is instrumental for metabolic health. And if you're not getting good sleep, which I wasn't, I was a chronic insomniac and that was a definite big, definitely a contributor, uh, to my, um, to my diabetes. What, what is a good sleep? What is considered as a good sleep? How many hours? I would say, you know, I mean, obviously the conventional wisdom is like eight hours. I would, I stick to that. You know, I, I think that, um, you know, this changes across the course of your life, but I mean, for me, I have a certain sleep window and this, uh, everyone has a slightly different, what is called a chronotype. So the chronotype is essentially like when your sleep window is, and that's generally uh, mirrored or a, a reflection, I should say, of um, kind of the endocrine balance that's happening within your body. So for example, you've probably heard of like the hormone um, cortisol. So it's a steroid hormone produced in your adrenal glands. A lot of people associate cortisol with stress, right? With bad right. stress or distress. And that is true to a certain degree, but cortisol is actually very, very important and very useful for the human body. We have a natural wave of cortisol that comes up in the morning. And that's again, very adaptive because we have to get out of bed and, and be alert and move around. And, uh, and that cortisol secretion and production in the morning really, really helps. Now cortisol has a counterposing molecule the sleep hormone, which is called melatonin, right? And so what you want to be is on this beautiful little balanced teeter totter where cortisol is coming up in the morning and then in the evening and then subsiding in the afternoon, there's another little peak and then it goes down. And as it goes down, melatonin's coming up, you know, cresting beautifully, you know, maybe around nine 30, 10 o'clock, and that's ushering you off to sleep. And, um, and we have a lot of 
uh, agency over that 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 equilibrium, that homeostasis, and a lot of it has to do with getting the right kind of light at the right time in the day, and then avoiding certain kinds of light at other times in the day. <laughs> and um, of course, if you can do that, and I'm happy to talk about that mechanism if it's interesting, but if you can do that and find that homeostasis, that balance, uh, then you will have better sleep. And of course, better sleep is associated with like memory consolidation. There's also the brain's version of the lymphatic system. It's called the glymphatic system. And that happens when you sleep. Your brain basically clears out, you know, some of these more toxic proteins like beta amyloid and, and uh, these tau proteins that are sometimes associated with Alzheimer's and, and dementia. Um, and, you know, obviously the physiological restoration, you know, that happens when you sleep and just subjectively, you feel like crap if you don't get good sleep and you're more likely to eat junky food and you're not going to get a good workout and you're probably going to treat your podcast host like dirt because you're cranky and irritable. Not you, <laughs> of course, but <laughs> I also know that there have been research uh, saying that if you're not getting sleep between 10 and I believe 5 a.m., between these hours, the chances that you're going to die earlier is like mm -hmm. raising a lot, like 10 or 20 percent, something like that. Yeah, I don't doubt it. I mean, sleep, again, is just foundational. It is foundational uh, for health. And no phones before sleep. Yeah, no phones. So this is, you know, this is what we're talking about with right. blue light, right? So and it's not just phones. It's, you know. Right now, I'm surrounded by so many screens, you can't even imagine, <laughs> um, you know, but your iPads and your laptops and your TVs, they all emit um, a certain band of the electromagnetic uh, wave spectrum between 380 and 500 nanometers called blue light. And um, of course, now many of our screens have a function called night shift. And everyone should activate that function because that will mute the amount of blue light that is coming from your screens in the evening. And, you know, the reason why this works, and I could spend probably four hours and bore everyone to tears on it, but essentially, again, the human body, this miracle here, has evolved in relation to its environment. So we used to sleep outside, more or less, or in a little hut and go out, spend most of our time immersed in nature. And in the inferior part of our retina, we have these specialized neurons, intrinsically sensitive ganglion cells, that sense this band of light, this blue light, and you get that and you get it into your neurons and your neurons send a message down to these little glands, um, these nodes above the roof of your mouth that then send another message to your pineal gland and says, hey, Vlad, you know, in 14 hours, I want you to release melatonin. And that's how that works. That mechanism works. And so the problem is, is that, you know, when you watch Larry David or whatever at night, <laughs> um, and I don't know what you like to watch, but, um, but, uh, you know, he's, he's an endocrine disruptor because mm -hmm. he's emitting blue light and you're, and you're getting that. Um, so, but there's so many ways, there's so much good, architecture for 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 optimal sleep certainly the screens are one of them and you know you want more amber light which more mimics the 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 bandwidth of fi like a fire right because we used to all sit around at night mm -hmm. yeah as hunter gatherers or whatever we used to all sit around the fire and tell stories and do podcast interviews and things like that <laughs> um and and of course you know that that fire was amber and it was usually below us. So it was coming into the superior part of the retina. It was in the inferior field. And so it didn't have that same impact um, hormonally on the body. And so a lot of, you know, a lot of these keys to healthy living is actually just asking yourself this question all the time. How did I evolve? How am I engineered? And then mimicking your life to align with that engineering. It's really not that much more difficult than that. Jeff, I have 
a question so I can kind of conclude everything that we've been discuss uh, we've been talking about something that's personally very important to me I mentioned to you my background south uh, south asian and we you know we obviously have some cultural issues I know it's a problem in America but in our in our culture it's uh, uh, certainly more prevalent uh, especially when it comes to diabetes and high blood pressure and as you mentioned a lot of these can be prevented and most importantly and optimistically reversed or reversed to a certain point. Uh, and you've shared incredible advices talking about uh, a, a, a greater consumption of fiber. You've talked about cold plunges. You've talked about uh, uh, resistance training, which is all fantastic. Now, here's the problem for me. Here's the problem. If I take this back to my parents and say, Mom, please, please, what, Jeff? I know you have a continuous glucose monitoring. The problem that I see here is I can't even convince, I'll speak for my community, the, these 40 plus year old uh, uh, parents or individuals, I can't even convince them to put on a GCM. So the, the problem that I see is there's a lot of lack of education. I, I, I don't, I, I, I know it's a very hard kind of question to answer, but Jeff, if you can speak to my mom, let's just say, for, for, for this response here, what, what would you tell her? Because I can tell you right now, out of all the advices that you've given us today, uh, the best we can probably do is increase her fiber intake. Uh, but other than that, I am highly doubtful. And I think many uh, uh, of our listeners can also resonate with this idea that, hey, Jeff, thank you so much for this great advice. But it kind of goes in one year uh, and... and right out the other year and we in reality don't practice don't practice it what's your mother's name raihana raihana okay so raihana here's my advice for, for you <laughs> can can she walk is she ambulatory she she can walk okay so this is pretty simple after every single meal take a walk it's just simply taking a walk after every single meal has on has outsized impacts on your blood glucose levels because really it is sedentary living and and being sedentary after you eat which allows glucose levels to spike and then subsequently taxes the pancreas to have to produce a lot of insulin and we get that 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 deadly kind of um, chain of events. So take a walk. That's simple, right? You don't have to get into a 34 degree ice plunge. Okay. Right. Just literally take a walk after every meal, after a big dinner, take a walk, try to put the last bite of food in your mouth three hours before you go to sleep. Okay. So, we can do that. We can probably most nights finish eating by 7, 7.15, go to bed at 10, 10.15. So you're actually primarily digested before you go into sleep. So you use your sleep as a period of restorative, uh, of, of, restor uh, of restoration and repair. So, you know, there are very little tricks like this. For example, acetic acid like vinegar, like I'm not sure you're going to get your mom to have a, a, a teaspoon or a tablespoon of vinegar, but vinegar or, or, and the acetic acid in it is a glucose vacuum, mm. just vacuums glucose uh, mm. out of the bloodstream. So there are very, some very, very simple things that, well, that is aren't very simple, actually. Yeah, that aren't like so onerous, like have right. some have some vinegar. Have some lemon water, even lemon, cinnamon, also mm -hmm. an amazing um, glucose sink. Take a walk. You know, you don't have to go like do 40 pound curls on balancing on a bozu ball, you know, whatever. She's not going to probably do that. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, I mean, I, I think that, um, that just, you know, everyone wants, to, here's the thing. You know, really what we want in life is our health span to be equivalent to our lifespan. Mm. 
you know, what we really want in life is to have a full life free of kind of these diseases of aging and decrepitude um, and the inability to take care of ourselves. right? So, you know, there are ways that we have, there, there are so many things that we can do, you know, and to, to, to reify that idea, you know, that we don't become dependent on other people. And, um, and, you know, this, this really like, you know, starts, you know, when we're in our thirties and forties is when we really, most of us really want to begin to pay attention to it because so many of these chronic diseases tend to be like very, very slow and progressive. They're like tortoises. And then, you know, you wake up one day and you feel a little chronic fatigue and feel a little brain fog and you've got a little dad bod and you got some like little man boobs and like all these things, whatever that you can just write off of like, oh, I just kind of had a bad mm. couple of weeks or whatever. Right. But then those conditions, those very prosaic anodyne common conditions are just upstream from some of these more um, insidious, you know, diseases that then, you know, we give labels like diabetes. And, uh, and this is why it's, you know, it's, it's really never too early in life to, to begin to adopt many of these protocols that, you know, that I call good stress. But, um, but I think, you know, that some of those simpler ones, you know, your mom might be able to get her head around. Great advice. Thank you so much for that. What a great way to end the conversation for me, at least. I always try to, you know, try to extract basic things that uh, a lot of us can apply because, you know, there's a subset of listeners who are going to do, you know, who are going to specialize in a lot of the things that we talk about. But for the majority of us, it, it's, it's kind of that notion of, okay, great, fantastic, but never implemented. But I, I, I certainly agree that uh, the, the, the points of advices that you've just given are straightforward and easy to do. And actually I need to, I need to implement that myself with the vinegar actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Try that one. That one, that one really, really works. Uh, and, and the, you know, yeah, not everyone's going to wear a CGM. Um, and, uh, but for me, because I do wear one, I get to do a tremendous amount of what I call me search. You know, yeah. I am my own kind of N of one experiment where it's like, oh, I'm going to try the acetic acid or I'm going to try to take a walk or, you know, why is it that blueberries spike me? Or if I have a handful of walnuts before I drink a glass of wine, look, I have no spike at all. But if I just right. have the glass of wine before without any fiber, I'm probably going to spike, you know, and when you have that dashboard into your into your own vehicle, um, you know, it 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 puts out a lot of data and, you know, what you can measure, you can improve. So hmm. I am actually going to look into getting into a CGM device. I've been on the fence, but I, I really need to because you're right. The me search uh, is very valuable, very, very valuable. Mm -hmm. You know, before yeah. we wrap up, I want to actually ask one last question about the supplements. Uh, sure. I mean, I think everyone knows, or maybe not, like the vitamins like A, D, K, E, along with the minerals like zinc, omega. I mean, this is like essential things that we should take. What are other things that you recommend that we're supposed to take as a supplement? Yeah, well, I'll try to think try to think of some out of the box ones for you because I think you know, as, as you say, you know. The fat soluble ones, the DAKE, um, a lot of people know about it. The the kind of PUFAs, omega threes are are very important. I, I certainly take those. Um, I've recently started to take algae supplements. Um, so algae is is kind of just an unbelievable um, organism. You know, it's two billion years old. Um, and it comes from like a cyanobacteria, like, and I'm talking microalgae. I'm not talking like the sea kelp that washes up on the seashore. That's also, you know, the Japanese eat that and stuff. But I'm talking microalgae, like spirulina, for example. So spirulina is like mm -hmm. unbelievable source of, um, of protein. Um, and if you take it in a tablet, um, it tastes fine. There's no like return. A lot of people don't like it cause it tastes awful. Um, but, uh, but spirulina is amazing and chlorella, which, you know, really upgrades mitochondrial function because it, 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 it has all sorts of antioxidants. 
um, in it. So that's a, that's a new one for me, which, um, uh, you know, the jury is still out. Can I really <laughs> tell the difference? Um, not sure, but spirulina and chlor chlorella, those are two forms of algae. Um, there is a new compound that um, I've started to take called urolithin A. Um, urolithin A is a supplement. Um, there's a company, I think, called Timeline Nutrition that, that makes it. It's essentially um, a, a postbiotic that you get from pomegranates. Um, it's, uh, you're, you're, you're actually, your microbiome, some people can make it themselves, but only about 20 or 25% of the people can make it themselves. It's basically a postbiotic, which is like when you eat like walnuts, for example, it has a compound of polyphenol called elagitannins, the gut bugs, certain gut bugs, uh, bacteria in your colon can then metabolize that and turn it into this compound called urolithin A. Or you can just supplement with urolithin A. And urolithin A, what it does is that it, it works on your mitochondria. So we talked about that earlier, those little organelles in, in your cells that are responsible for making energy. And what it helps the mitochondria do is actually break down and recycle. So over time, mitochondria become dysfunctional sometimes because of an abundance of free radicals that are produced at the mitochondrial level. And this urolithin A helps in this process called mitophagy, essentially the breakdown of dysfunctional mitochondria and the creation of new mitochondria called mitobiogenesis. So that's a, that's a very interesting new compound. And there's quite a lot of clinical research on it. So, you know, urolithin A is, is the other out of the box one I'll give you. <laughs> so Jeff, Tell awesome. me, please, what is the one piece of advice you wish you knew sooner? Mm, that's a good one. Okay. Behind all of these different protocols and behaviors, there's one protocol and behavior. So I'll put it in this context. When I started fasting, and condensed all my, um, my consumption into an eight hour window, you know, I was pretty disciplined about it, but of course there would be a moment across those 16 hours where I would feel hungry. And normally when I felt hungry, I would just sort of meander unconsciously over to the cupboard and open it up and just grab whatever was in there and stuff it in my gullet. You know, that was my normal behavior. But because I was under this, you know, disciplined eight hour window, I actually couldn't do that. So I actually had to then stop and witness the nature of the stimulus, the nature of the mm -hmm. hunger and actually discern is this hunger a biological need or is it an emotional or psychological desire? And over time, I began to be very good at delineating between does my body actually need this or am I eating my feelings or needing comfort? Am I assuaging some other emotional tumult or deficiency that I'm feeling? And, you know, Viktor Frankl, you know, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning, a wonderful book, um, you know, he said this, he's like, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space lies your liberation and freedom. So fasting for me almost forced me to find that space. And once I did that, that space was so liberating because it didn't just apply to food. It applied to, was I getting mad at my kids? Was it, it was applied to Instagram. It was applied to drinking. It was applied to every part of my life that required a little bit of space, a little bit of pause between stimulus and response. And of course, this is very connected to a meditation practice, et cetera. Um, but that is the mindset that really sits behind everything. 
um, is becoming conscious of that which is normally unconscious. And that can really bend the arc of the totality of your life, not just prevent diabetes, but actually impact every relationship that you have, yeah. even the relationship you have with yourself. Wow. Wow. What a great way to end this, Jeff. <laughs> Please let us know, let our viewers know what you have going on, where they can find you, and any exciting projects that you have coming up. Yeah, well, again, thank you guys so much. I, I really uh, enjoyed you. speaking it's... with you. I, I loved your questions. They're actually a little bit different than the ones I normally get asked, so they, they challenge me. And, um, and I love this medium because it brings me into the present moment. Like, I'm totally right here with you guys. I'm not anywhere else. I'm not checking my phone. My, my mind yeah. is not wandering. <laughs> you know, I'm right here. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I have a course uh, an online course that sits on my platform called Commune. Um, it's called Good Stress. I talk a lot about these protocols that uh, you know align us with our biology that that helped me lose sixty pounds and reverse my diabetes, et cetera. I talk about a lot of the protocols that we, you know, uh, hovered over. So you know, you can find that on Commune. It's just onecommune.com. Uh, if you go onecommune.com slash Good Stress, you'll go right to the course. And, you know, I host a podcast called The Commune Podcast. Um, I'm just so fortunate to, to feature so many brilliant doctors and thought leaders and authors and entrepreneurs um, uh, on that podcast. So uh, uh, that's another place, you know, and, and I write a, a weekly blog called Commusings. That's like 2,000 words every week. <laughs> so that I'm over a literary barrel <laughs> uh, every week. And, um, and that challenges me to, to better express myself week over week. So, um, so that's a, another place where people can find me and I'm on Instagram, you know, waxing, uh, alternately poetic and pathetic, um, at Jeff Krasno. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's where people can find me. Awesome. Well, of course, we'll have all that in the hyperlinks uh, down below. Jeff, what an absolute delight. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Pleasure is mine. Thanks.